beautiful East Tennessee in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains. You are listening to the Sherry Voluntary Show, and I do appreciate you spending your time with me. Today, my guest is someone that you may not be familiar with, but is very knowledgeable on the topic of civil asset forfeiture, and that is Mr. Eric Wyatter, and he is with Campaign to End Civil Asset Forfeiture. So thanks for coming on the show, Eric. Thank you for having me on. That's great. So we've, we've known each other for a little while through... Mm-hmm. Pol- pol- political events here in town and stuff, but you've been doing this, um, I guess this, is it an action committee or what is? Sure. So the group, the campaign to end civil asset forfeiture started, I would say probably late 2015, early 2016, around that time. And it was a uh, forum to reform uh, Tennessee's civil asset forfeiture laws. Um, this are now a registered political action committee. Um, so in regards to that, we took that official step. Um, so for people who don't know, really, and I think most of my audience does, but just in case, explain what civil asset forfeiture is and some of the background of why the government says that it even needs civil asset forfeiture. Sure. sure. So what it is is it's a process where the legal case is against the property itself and not the owner. And so it allows government to take someone's property without a criminal conviction of the person. And sometimes the legal cases will even be like the state of Tennessee versus, you know, $20,000 in cash right. or something like that. And this is separate from the criminal forfeiture process. They actually get a criminal conviction and then they take the person's property. Um, and and uh, sell the proceeds. Right, which like to me, I mean, <clears throat> you can clearly make an argument, a better argument for someone who's already been convicted and has, say, a Ferrari from the proceeds of whatever illegal thing, probably drugs, which, as you know, I believe shouldn't be illegal in the first place. But uh, this is pre-conviction of anything. And, and I think what a lot of people don't understand and should understand is that the the police officer, when they say pull you over on the side of the road, you can just have, I think they said the national average is $800 is what they take. That can be your rent money that you're taking to go pay your rent. And they can say, I think this is drug money. They don't have to have a reason other than their suspicion. So there doesn't have to be any paraphernalia. There doesn't have to be any other reason other than that. They pulled you over and you have a large sum, larger than what they think you should have, which... I don't see how anyone can really argue for this. It's it's complete and utter theft. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I always try to reach out to police officers and, and explain to them that they're, you know, they don't give up their moral agency because they are law enforcement, that they still are responsible for the things that they do as a moral agent. Nobody can give that up. So, you know, when you're stealing from people, you're stealing from people. And, and I, you would think the police would be, behind this if, you know, they want to um, be peace officers and protect the citizenry from government predation. But are the police behind it? So anytime (laughs) we bring up this legislation and this now in Tennessee, uh, meaningful legislation has been brought up every year since 2015. And the one group that is consistently opposing it is the attorneys, the sheriffs, and the police chiefs. Right. Um, now, there are some instances, to be fair, of legislators who are supporting reform, like uh, Bud Halsley of East Tennessee, and then um, is someone who uh, has said that he would like to see criminal conviction happen before anyone's property can be sure. taken. So, you know, on the flip side, I mean, they're not current law enforcement right now, but they were. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. the law consistently yeah. opposing on this. Now, in the city of Knoxville, you know, where, where, where we're living is uh, uh, Gloria Johnson said she contacted the police chief and the police chief had no concerns about our bill this year. So, I mean, hmm. at the very least, she wasn't opposing it. But, right. But that's I don't I don't think that's typical. That's that's interesting because I know we had a, a planned time to go to the state capitol to talk directly about civil asset forfeiture with um, legislators. And it got tabled because the police departments around the state were calling and saying, we can't, we can't police 
child sex trafficking, or illegal immigration. It was funny to me that it's just those two things that they mentioned they couldn't police, uh, because I think you know they're, the the aim is to try and um, play on the emotions of the highly heavily Republican state of Tennessee, the people there, and who wouldn't, of course, nobody wants child sex trafficking, um, but who don't want illegal immigration or very concerned about that, and so it just keeps this this going with you know the emotionalism that's behind it and the sort of back the blue mentality of Mm -hmm. we've got to make sure our officers are taken care of. But really, I mean, isn't this most often just kind of a a slush fund for the police officers or the departments around the state? Um, Sure. So the funds do go into a separate account um, that the police control directly. Uh, There's no legislative oversight. Uh, In Tennessee, this is going to be the where there will actually be an audit coming out publicly showing people how the money is being spent. Uh, in the past, uh, there, there was an article recently where Tennessee law enforcement spent $100 on catering. Right. Um, and they got a slap on the wrist for that by the uh, Department of Justice because that violated federal guidelines. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, in Tennessee, this will be the first year we will actually see how the money is being spent. Wow. So there's there's really two things with that. The first being there's no oversight of it. Like mm-hmm. you can just take that and there's no oversight. When is that ever good in government for them to have no no oversight of at least accountability, you know, for whatever they say that they're they're about. Um, and then the other thing would be the federal the federal government having a problem with it because they do something called equitable sharing. Mm-hmm. And would you like to explain what equitable sharing is? So equitable sharing is the federal government's program. Uh, So what they do is they cooperate with local and state law enforcement, and then they have like a a sharing agreement on the percentage of the proceeds. Um, The standards of due process and protection for individuals is really low on the equitable sharing uh, so what we're seeing right now across the nation, and a lot of this has happened just teen, is we now have 16 states that require a criminal conviction um, and in all cases or in most cases. And we have nine states that have some type of restriction on equitable sharing. However, for states who have done things like criminal conviction or have high standards of due process, Um, What it allows law enforcement and government agencies to do is pass cases off to the feds and undermine their state. Right. And so Tennessee, we have just started improving our state laws. And what the evidence so far is showing is that equitable sharing is being used more in our state. And and I think that trend will probably continue. Yeah. that, That when I first heard about, of course, civil asset forfeiture, I was floored. And then when I learned about equitable sharing, I was really, really floored. And and the thing is, is that that to me just shows how dishonest they're actually being about this and how predatory that the police have become on the citizenry along with the federal government. And and I think it's it goes to the heart of a lot of what uh, we talk about on my show, which are abuses of the state against the individual and this is the, it's, it's a clear, um, not, not coercion, but the clear, the, clearly they're working together, cooper, cooperation between the state and local law enforcement to maintain a level of corruption that they, they, they never should have happened in the first place. And I remember watching a documentary, um, it was actually by Vice, and it's it's very very good. It's the uh, they have several law enforcement and they're speaking about it. Uh, but one of them is the guy that came up with the concept of civil asset forfeiture. I forget his name, but he 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 says that it's basically it was a way for them to get money into their departments, and that it came under the guise of policing drugs and the drug war. But that it was really it's just a way to get money into the departments. Um, and fund whatever it is they want. So I'm just, I, I'm so amazed that people are okay with 
this sort of subversion of even the the state governments, the people who are law and order type folks and mm-hmm. states' rights folks seem do they not care? Or are they just uneducated about it? What do you? What is your experience? So, so definitely, I would say uneducated. I think there's a lot of ignorance. Um, they don't understand. You know, I'm talking about the legislators. Uh, they, I don't really think they get it. Um, you know, and some of them, you know, once they hear, and, and this is what we'll hear in Nashville. It's so funny. Like every, this. Well, I got to talk to my guys back home. That was all. You know, that was something they would say. Like I got to talk to my guys, and it's so funny because they were always always referring to law enforcement, but they right. never said that. They would always use that language, and so yeah, that was interesting. You know, um, you know, in regards to that. Yeah, I, it seems that. Well, I mean, I've said it many times. Politicians are whores. That's what their job is. They're to whore themselves out to who will keep them in power, and so with this uh, idea of police officers being heroes just because they signed up to do this job, um, and there's this real authoritarian back the blue mentality that that plays into the whorish behavior of the politicians because they can't seem to be seen to somehow be not supporting the police. Mm -hmm. So it's a very difficult situation, I would think, that that you would be in and people like you who are fighting against this because you have to convince people who rely on the, you know, the way the public looks at them um, in order to maintain power and also that public wants them to be in the police, you know, on their side. And yet you might have an individual legislator who sees the problems with it. So, but, but feels unable to act because, of course, they want to maintain power. Mm-hmm. So is that something that you've, have you had someone who felt that way? A legislator would like, I would really like to support this, but my constituency won't go for it. And how would you deal with that? Yeah, so that's definitely a concern that they have, but they're not going to say my constit like they're not going to say my constituency doesn't support this because every poll and there was one in Tennessee recently and it's overwhelming majorities once they're educated on the issue mm-hmm. they meaningful reform happen including criminal convictions. Um so but you do get the legislators that like to say in principle I support with what you guys are doing. It's just, you know, you know, law enforcement things like that. You do mm-hmm. but the 2016 was the first time we had a meaningful, well, 2015 was the first time there was a meaningful bill, but in 2016 was the first time we we heavily backed a meaningful bill. We were able to get two co-sponsors out of legislators. This time around, we have 40. So the tide is turning. Uh, Reform bills have been passed, not criminal conviction or restrictions on equitable sharing. Those are like the two primary goals, but there have been reports the reporting bills so to go to one of the points you were making earlier and this is and i have the reports here too so prior to 2016 when there was no reports in tennessee it was the wild one like you could even see from 2016 to like say now 2018 when you look at the reports you could even see that the numbers have changed like for instance the number of cases open versus arrest uh, the arrests have gone up dramatically and and um, you actually you know want that because you need an arrest to have a criminal conviction. In, in that instance, you want that situation. Um, otherwise, what was happening before is you were having cases being open and there was no arrest being criminal conviction, but these people still had to fight to get their property back. Right. I mean, it was just really the wild west. So it, even those reporting bills created an observational effect where where the, the police have modified their behavior civil asset for sure you know even if just very modestly they they modified yeah and it's interesting to me um that people who claim to want to help the poor would not also want to see this gone because i can i can deal with losing eight hundred dollars like i I mean i wouldn't like it but i could take the hit and i wouldn't lose my home you Mm -hmm. know i wouldn't it wouldn't put me in a, a very bad situation but most of the people that civil asset forfeiture happens to are not wealthy people. Uh, not that I'm wealthy, but are not even middle class. Mm-hmm. And so um, they're, they're really most often preying on the most vulnerable and marginalized people in society. 
And this can set off a domino effect that can just wreak havoc in their lives. I, I saw a young man explaining, um, it, it wasn't about civil asset forfeiture, but it was about how once you're arrested, that it can really um, just start this chain reaction that you can't stop. And it's very difficult to stop. And, and he said he got arrested for something. It wasn't really a big deal. It was like driving on a suspended license. And so um, I think they took his license away because he couldn't afford to pay the fine. There was a fine that he was given at first, and he couldn't afford to pay it. So they took his license, and then he couldn't work because he had to have his car to get to his job, and he was trying to find work. But all this is still going on. Um, while he's doing that. And, and so it came to the point where he was put in jail because of this and over something really, really minor. Mm-hmm. And um, I think civil asset forfeiture, not only are you stealing from people, but you're also often stealing from people who are living paycheck to paycheck and then expecting them to have also the money to go and fight this huge system that they don't really know the ins and outs of mm-hmm. often and win their own property back that mm-hmm. that is is theirs. It's their private property, but the state basically just takes it and they sue the, the property, <laughs> which yeah. is it's incredible. That's just incredible That's to crazy. me. That, and, and this was something that a lot of people are not aware of, but let's say you are a lower income person and they take your used car, which is worth a thousand or two thousand uh, dollars, that vehicle back. You have to pay a three hundred and fifty dollar bond wow. to even get a hearing to to try to get your property back, and that process alone can take months. Right. Uh, so what happened to hundred Tennesseans is something that's called uh, the end result was called a settlement, and this happened to about twelve hundred people. And what this scenario is is let's say they take your vehicle that's uh, three thousand dollars value. Here's the process to get your vehicle back. Uh, it's going to be, you know, maybe take six to nine months. You have to pay this $350 bond. You have to show up to the hearing. Or if you give us $500 into our police fund right now. Right. And this Describe. is happening. Yeah. I mean, it, wow. this is very serious. And, and now there are some very key legislators that have serious concerns. So we may see that process right. be abolished next year. We'll it, it's it's one of those things that the, the system, because it's the system, it doesn't, when there's an injustice, it doesn't turn very swiftly. I mean, we have people who are known innocent in jail for murders or rapes or whatever, and they're still sitting there, even though people know that they're innocent. They've actually been proved because they have to get a new trial, and it has to be based on new evidence, and DNA is not always acceptable as new evidence in the trial. Like, it, there's mm-hmm. just some, this is the part that it's, it's, the damaging part of legalism. Uh, and so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's just really interesting to me that people don't understand how, I guess it's, it's hard to understand. They make it very difficult to understand. And, and, but this with civil asset forfeiture, the thing for me is that it's, it's not very difficult to understand the, the process to go through it is difficult, but it's not yes. difficult to understand that saying, you know, if you if you grease the the wheels over here, then we'll let you go. And and in that Vice documentary I mentioned, which I would recommend everyone watch, it's only fifteen or twenty minutes long. Um, they actually show video of, but they talk about how police officers on the side of the road do very much the same thing, where they say, "So we're taking your car, or we're taking your money, whatever it is they're taking." And um, in a few weeks, you're going to get a subpoena, and you can fight it. That's your decision, but if you fight it, we're going to arrest you. So you're already you're compounding something that you already is going to be a, a hardship in someone's life, and making it worse, and telling them if you try to get your own property back, and you've not even been charged with a crime, we're going to arrest you. Uh, and you know, but if you don't, if you just leave the property with us, you're free to go. You're free and clear. Like that, it's it's so clearly corrupt and immoral. And I just, I, I, I've talked to so many people who don't seem to care. So in my mind, I get very discouraged about civil asset forfeiture because it's, it just seems so clear. It seems so, I don't, I don't know what's very difficult to understand, but maybe because you've dealt with more people, maybe you have a different 
outlook on it? Do you do you think people are really like you said coming around like the average citizen? Do you think mm-hmm. they're really? So to go to your first point, there's no question about it. The de- against the people, so a lot of them. They what they're really handed is multiple bad choices, and then they have to pick one of those bad choices. A great way to put it. Uh, the other thing to go to your point, so poll after poll, and in, in in some cases, and I think this was the case in Tennessee, the majority of voters are not aware of this issue. Um, you know, just to give like a very brief history about civil asset forfeitures, so started. Uh, started being expanded in the in the 90s at the state level, um, but really it wasn't until after September 11th, 2001, mm-hmm. that that we started seeing the hockey stick. You know, as far as how much. They- mm-hmm. And then the Washington Post did a great series in 2014, which really started bringing this to spotlight. In Tennessee, you could even Google it. There was a um, who's that British guy in the comedy show. Uh, he has that, uh, he's the comedian, uh, Oliver, is it, or John? Oh, John Oliver, yeah. John Oliver, he actually did Hilarious. one, and it focuses on Tennessee, and he just tears into our civil forfeiture laws. But, mm-hmm. um, so really, it has been an issue that uh, people are, in the last five years, are learning about. And like I said, most of the reforms have happened since 2015. So relatively speaking, when you're talking about legislative change, happening quite rapidly you know to go from prior to 2015 there were zero states that had a restriction on equitable sharing and now we're at nine you know and and uh, there were some states um going criminal convictions but i mean we're at 16 just recently arkansas became the 16th state uh that that had passed criminal convictions i think it's shameful when arkansas can see it more clearly than Tennessee. I just, I mean, maybe that's, you know, I'm, that's bias for sure, but they're friggin' Arkansas, okay? And you know what? Not <laughs> one legislator voted no on that bill. Not wow. one. That's amazing. I I think it, it civil asset forfeiture, like I said before, it really does go to the heart of so many other issues because you have criminal justice reform in that. You have the drug war in, tied up in it. Um, and just the ideas of, more, philo- more philosophical ideas like what is the role of government if there is one in the individual's life. And, and so it really is a, it's an issue that I think is, is really important, especially for people who do want to see change in, you know, the, the freedoms that we have in the country um, that they should really be well informed on because it, it can take you in so many directions. And, and another sort of more idealistic um, concept would be the idea of incrementalism as opposed to just getting rid of it altogether right away. And we were talking about this a little bit before the, pr- the show started, um, that you know, sometimes you have to chip away at something uh, rather than get rid of it as a whole because there's no way, I think, in the beginning when you started and other people started really fighting this, that you were going to convince any legislature to just get get done with it because there was no real great data and you know nothing coming in saying this is a bad thing um which for me you could look at it and see that it's going to be a bad thing just because of human nature mm-hmm. and the way states prey on people um i could see that but a lot of people don't think in those terms so i think that's you know, how, that incrementalism seems to be working, like you said, with the nine and now 16. You know, in in Tennessee, we have a very entrenched opposition. You know, certain mm-hmm. states early on, like New Mexico, Nebraska, Ohio, they were able to uh, pass legislation that did meaningful reform. It's not going to happen in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but I mean, but again, to go from two, two co-sponsors to 40 in three years. That's right. Awesome. I mean, even, you know, I remember like uh, Timothy Hill, Representative Timothy Hill of East Tennessee, you know, he had the first bill ever in 2015. And then in 2016, we met with him and he's like, well, what I'm thinking about is let's do this reporting. But the group of us. We're like, you know, we're not interested in that. We want to do meaningful reform because it goes to your point. Like, look, we know about this issue. This is wrong. You right. guys just need to get rid of this. 
But, you know, these legislators are dealing with a hundred different and they're being torn two different ways on each of those issues. So the amount of tension they have on just one issue is limited, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and in some cases, yeah, they should know better, but to be fair, sometimes they don't know. Mm -hmm. No one has ever brought this to their attention. Um, So, but again, you know, that, even that 2016 reporting bill and the reporting bills have been expanded since then, just that observational effect, police knew, okay, they're watching us behavior started changing. And then last year we did pass a reform bill um, that has the early evidence is it seems like we're, we're taking some steps in the right direction. We'll- yeah, that's great. I, I think it's it's great what you, you're doing and what people like you are doing all over the country because, you know, I, I mean, as being a, a voluntarist and an anarchist, um, of course, I I want sweeping change, <laughs> like, but you know, dealing in reality, the fact that most people aren't even close to being able to consider those kinds of realities um, and don't even see them, that we have to, or there there have to be people like you that are at least trying to fight in the system and mm-hmm. stop these things, and so. Um, I, I, without being a, like, I'm not a fan of pragmatism, but as being pragmatic on some, some things, I think that's a a really great, uh, focus to have that if you're going to fight, you know, city hall or whatever, this is a really great issue because it, it can gain you, um, credibility with people and learning that you're not just coming in there and wanting to burn it down like I would. Like, you yeah. want them to... Well, you know, and, and I, I don't want to come across pessimistic. I see, like, I, I even think next year it's possible we can get a criminal conviction bill passed well. that would require it in, you know, possibly most instances. You know, one of the things the Institute of Justice is working on with they did this in Arkansas and are currently doing this in uh, South Carolina, but at, at the very least they're doing this with other states, is the idea of requiring criminal convictions on low dollar amounts. Um, and this kind of goes to your point. Now you're thinking, okay, what does it matter if we require criminal convictions? But I'm just going to throw out a number here, $1,000, or your vehicle's worth $3,000. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, what the numbers go, what the numbers show, and this you were saying about affecting low-income people that a large percentage of these cases are very low dollar amounts. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking $500, $200. In Tennessee, there was one average was $45. Wow. It's a joke. And so we can protect a large percentage of, of innocent people by doing something like that happens that just that really makes me angry yeah that because 45 dollars that's not an unusual amount for anyone to have in their pocket Mm -hmm. and for that to be something that i i I guess one thing it's not a happy situation but i'm happy that the police are outing themselves on these things and they they really are making the case for you know, this to happen for there to be mm-hmm. reform in this area because they clearly can't handle the responsibility of actually being honest. You know, when, when you're given the leeway to say, well, I can, I can make the law right now while we're standing here. I can decide whether or not this person's guilty or whatever. So I, I think there's, it's it's just amazing to me that people who would take on a job where they take an oath to, uphold the constitution and you know to to protect and serve supposedly would so blatantly pre- prey on people it just yeah it's, you know it's and a sad situation and it's re- and it's really tough to say how many law enforcement officers engage in you know, like the judicial drug task force in Tennessee these are multi county jurisdictions right. you know i I think they rely on these funds pretty heavily. So when it comes to those guys, I think they're they're probably all in the know. But you know, Knox County Sheriff or Knoxville police officer, I don't really know how many of them engage. Like I've I've uh, had a conversation with a couple of them, and they 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 weren't aware of this. They didn't oh, really? even know. What it was. So 
So I would even say some of them, you know, have no idea about this. But again, I don't really know the numbers. I I wonder if it's a matter of being educated when they come into contact with, you know, if they're drug enforcement officers, they're they're dealing with that. that, Yeah. What's the nature of your role in the law enforcement? So maybe that's that your average beat cop doesn't necessarily know about it. But I, I know some some areas are more uh, it's more prevalent than others. Um, and I, something you said earlier really piqued my interest because you talked about um, the hockey stick mm-hmm. of, of acceptance of these things or whatever after 9-11. The money taken. Yeah. And just that whole Patriot Act mentality of if you have nothing to hide, you hide nothing. And it, th- this idea, another you know, really core value of people who love freedom is, is privacy and that we are under surveillance so much now. And people have really like with red light cameras, I remember talking to someone about this and they said, why do you care really? Like this is such a small, you know, issue. Like it's just running a red light. Do you want people to run red lights? And no, that's not the point. The point is, is that they practice incrementalism as well And that's one of the ways that they get people used to being under surveillance and used to having their privacy violated so that then when the next thing comes, like my friend Mike Meharry in Lexington, Kentucky, who the the city ended up suing him because he asked about a surveillance camera in his local park, his neighborhood park. He's like, why is this here? And they didn't want to tell him. He got the the state's attorney general said, you have to turn this information over to him. And they're fighting it. And they Mm -hmm. actually sued him. So you see this sort of idea where they really feel entitled. The the state really feels entitled to everything that you, of course, they believe they own us. The federal government believes it owns us. Um, but these, these officers really feel entitled to your, your, your privacy and, to, mm-hmm. you know, whatever means they have to take to do their job. This ends justifies the means mentality. And so... I know I talk about police a lot, but it really, for me, that's, it's such a, um, you're calling yourself a servant, but you're mm-hmm. acting as a wolf. And, and that to me is just something I can't abide. Like, yeah. Well, <laughs> and to go to your point, you know, another issue too, are focusing on what? Shaking down people for money. Is mm-hmm. that really what we, what we want police officers to focus on? I mean, mm-hmm. even from a libertarian perspective or, you know, like a, a capital or, you know. Anarcho-capitalist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, even from that perspective, I think we can all agree on that there's certain crimes that we would universally find right. very troubling. You know, uh, you know, theft, murder, things like that. That should be the focus of the police officers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, focusing on that type and those types of crimes, uh, crimes that have victims. And right now, I mean, we, I mean, th- and, but now this is kind of older data, but there was a new Tennessee who did a report on one of the judicial drug task force. And the vast majority of the focus, the vast majority of the cases for that one judicial drug task force was cases of money. They had like, and then in, in a given year, they had one case of actual seizure of the drugs, right? Wow. And so what does that tell you? They're, I mean, it's they crazy. Don't even, yeah, it's the you're focus. incentivized just to take the money well, and, and not it, care about the drugs. Yeah. <laughs> you're absolutely right. I mean, that that's it. And that's that's the worst part, too, is, you know, they're, they're not even trying to stop victim crimes. Right. It's, it's about collecting cash from people. Right crazy yeah it's revenue generation yeah that's that's really what policing has become um and and just the fact that yeah there was the 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 story it was years ago now where um the law enforcement in tennessee were sitting on one side of 75 because to to catch drug dealers but they were getting the money after the transaction had been made so on going down to florida they didn't they weren't on that yeah. side of the freeway. They were on the other side where they're stopping them and collecting the yeah. money. So that that tells you right there. It's just a disingenuous position. If you really care about 
getting drugs off the street, which is a whole other issue. Yeah. But if you really cared about that, that's where you would be. You would be on that end to stop it from happening, not the we're going to profit off of what we consider nefarious activities. Exactly. Exactly. I, I just don't know what you say to people who who say otherwise. I've, I've been stumped in, in some of these cases. It's like... I, I'm trying to talk sense to you, and you won't even see it. You know? Well, you know, you know what's interesting too, and in, and in to to go to Tennessee's example is, you know, in Tennessee. So right now, we don't know how much of the money is criminal forfeiture and how much is civil. But to combined, we're talking about seventeen million dollars, based on say last year's report. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's pretty consistently been fifteen million and above. Let's say if we were to come up with a process that basically just outright abolished this, you know, with how flush Tennessee is with cash, it could easily cover 15, 17 million. And so it'd be budget law enforcement, mm. you know, but it and at the same time, they wouldn't have to violate the Constitution and do all these things. Right. And, and to your point, too, you know, if you're a poor person and five hundred dollars is taken from you. That's huge. That yeah. could be your rent for the month. Yeah. And and or if your vehicle that you drive to work is taken from you, you're in a real bad yeah. situation now. And it happens. You know. <laughs> and, and then or the, the other option sort of civil forfeiture and find the money in the budget. Mm -hmm. You know, to to, to so it, because I think the cops biggest concern obviously is their budget, I think personally. And and then mm -hmm. I think their second concern is they Slush fund, right. where they don't have legislative oversight. Of course, of course. I, it, and and we've seen that it doesn't go to policing. Like there, we covered articles um, on the radio show where uh, it had, was one more article where the police had been having parties on the, mm -hmm. with this money and taking, you know, like you said, the catering or trips. And so it, it's not like this money actually goes to policing. But then when when the bill comes up that's going to do something about it, they call and say, we can't police without this money. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it's just a, a, it's a flat out lie really yeah. is what yeah, it is. Yeah, you are right about that. So um, it's, it's, but they're very highly incentivized to steal from people. And, and this is why, you know, if you can compare police to a street gang, they're just ones that have authority behind them. They have the authority of the state behind them that says that makes it legal for them yeah, to steal your money. And, and so that's a, it's a huge problem. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm, I really admire the work that you're doing to, to do something about this. Cause I know yeah, it's not you. easy. And I know you spend a lot of time doing that. Like when, when we went recently, um, I went with our friend Justin with AFP mm. and you went as well. Uh, up to the state house, um, I wanted to confront Senator Briggs on his raw milk thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't even get into vac you know, forced vaccinations. But anyways, uh, you had, you said that was your fourth or fifth time in a row every fifth, weekend. Yeah, fifth. and Tuesday. Like, yeah, and you knew that like everybody where we walked by, you're like, hey, and, like, <laughs> knew everybody. So, I, you know, I mean, for me, it's like going in the belly of the beast, but. If you're going to work in this manner, you have to get to know these people. You have yeah. to go up there and, and do that. So, I mean, I, I really do admire that because it's a lot of people, you know, it's easy to talk about how bad these things are, yeah. but it's a lot harder to do something about that and, and to put your own self out there to be yelled at and ridiculed. I mean, I know what that's like, so I, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, and, and on our trip there, we were talking a, a little bit. I, I want to kind of move on now to maybe you personally a little bit, because um, I, I think your story is really interesting and in how you were in the green party, <laughs> party yeah. before. And so tell us a little bit about your evolution as a political activist. OK, so, well, I'll start off. So it was um, this would have been the 1992 election. I was uh, picked by my grade school class to represent <laughs> George Bush the first in a debate. Somebody was representing Perot, and then somebody was representing Clinton. Perot, well, yeah. it's been a minute. <laughs> and then, um, so that was, there was that, and then um, started college, the indoctrination. Uh, I was a history major, so I read, you know, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States and everything, and... and uh, Heard Ralph Nader on uh, speak on C-SPAN. Right. I was like, I really like what this guy's saying. So, 
yeah, I got involved in the Green Party um, for pretty much my whole time in college. Uh, and But I was also doing, like, local election stuff, too. But at the same time, to, you know, to go back to in, indoctrination, I had a Professor Bean. He taught American conservatism. And so I read some of his books that he recommended in class. At the time, I didn't have any conversion. But, you know, it definitely planted the seeds. And then about six years later, two. I start rereading, you know, Road to Serfdom, Hot Hayek and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, the good this is stuff. it. <laughs> I was like, at that point, that was 2009 was definitely when I made the conversion. And then I was introduced to Ron Paul. And so, yeah, there was that. And then I lived in Illinois at the time. So when I made the conversion politically, I was just like, there's no point in fight, like fighting in Illinois right. for liberty. Right. That state salvation for it. So <laughs> it's like at that point I forget when it was well actually I went to a talk with Tom Woods and I went with a buddy I met through the Ron Paul campaign and you know one of the things like I don't know if he's still Tom Woods would have these conversations and he would say you know what is the thing you can do for liberty like all of us have some mm-hmm. skill that we excel at and um you know for for you would be doing this podcast talking i talk yeah. for liberty <laughs> and then for maybe me it's like campaigns and elections and then but one of the things he was saying because he was speaking to an audience from illinois is he's like well maybe you move <laughs> like that's the thing you do for liberty mm-hmm. and uh, i think i was already thinking about it before i heard him say that but i think you know i kind of confirmed things and started yeah. thinking about it and Really, Tennessee, if, if you support liberty, I truly do believe it's one of the top states in the, in the United really? States. Really? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, obviously there would be debate there, you know, and there's some issues that we do lag behind, you know, like we're talking about one civil asset yeah. forfeiture. There's some social issues, but, you know, uh, overall, I think we're moving in the right And not only that, compared to some of the other states, you know, I definitely would probably consider us in the top five. Yeah. I- I guess, you know, we, we talk to a different segment of sure. the population a lot of times. And I, I just find, and maybe it's not even that, it's, it's my point of view, my point of view of people. And when I, when I see, like, the thin blue line Punisher sticker or, you know, the Gadsden flag with an American flag and, and mm-hmm. you know, a thin blue line sticker, to me that is just it almost seems insurmountable that kind of mindset of people who want so badly to follow orders, but also want so badly to be bastions of freedom, but they don't understand that following orders isn't, doesn't lead to freedom and Mm -hmm. and that these are the people that will be taking those guns that you love so much. (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I find East Tennessee very, authoritarian and and to me that's it's just uh, um it seems like an uphill battle but I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because you know maybe it helps me a little to to be a little bit more optimistic with people and especially like with your story um what we were talking about is that we all come from somewhere right and and sometimes I forget what a neocon I used to be and that if I can you know come to a better understanding of what real liberty is then there's hope for other people as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Well, and it's, I mean, that's another thing too, you know, um, you know, one positive, but when you are interacting with other people, you know, there's a good possibility they have never read Ron Paul Hayek. I'd say a very high probability. You know, so, <laughs> so the chances are is like, think about, okay, what was I thinking like before I was introduced to yeah. Tom Woods and, and Peter Schiff and people like that, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, but that's one thing when I was a Democrat, like, okay, so I was a green and then I became a Democrat, right? All right? So <laughs> there was a transition. There. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but one of the things, even in Illinois, the Republicans always stood out is they always respected the opposition and they had fun with it. Yeah. And so, and, and, but on the Democrat side, people, mm-hmm. you know, and so, I think that's one of the things, like, you never want to be that nasty person because one of the things that stuck with me is seeing Republicans still be friendly with people who they disagreed with. And um, I think that kind of helped with my conversion, too. 
sure. you know, because it really showed their true colors, you know. And I, obviously mm-hmm. it's not universal. I know there's some Republicans right. that are very nasty, you know, like people are people. But, right. You know. I, I, think, I think you are right about that. And that's why um, often, which I disagree with them, often libertarians will say, well, you know, I don't agree with Republicans, but they're better than Democrats because at least you can talk to them. I, some issues, yeah. Mm-hmm. Some issues, that's true. But I think you're right. In general, there is this acceptance of the arena of ideas by the, the what's called the right. Um, and that there really isn't on the left. It's more of the, um, you know, you, you shame people into. So it doesn't really matter anymore what they actually think. We just want them in lockstep with us on what they say they think. Mm -hmm. So they really aren't concerned with a heart change in in people. They're concerned with the optics, really, of of society and how it how they go about bringing change is just you know that well you don't want to be uh, called a racist, which has Mm -hmm. very little impact on people anymore because they called people racist for so many things because it's a terrible thing to be. People don't generally want to be that, uh, but but they've used it so much on things that really aren't racism that it dilutes the impact of real, you know, say racism or whatever. But that sort of shaming tactic, and you know, I'm not saying that's never appropriate, and I've never done it. Like I, I think people should be shamed for shameful ideas. I think if you are for say forced vaccinations, you don't understand liberty. You don't understand a parent's right. And an individual's right to their health care. Um, and so I, I think those things, if someone will not budge at all and is unwilling to work, then maybe a little shame is necessary. But the, the idea is to get people to shift, but in a way that still maintains um, a certain orderliness and credibility because you you can't ever get anywhere if it's just this cacophony of voices yeah. screaming and no one getting personal heard. attacks and things like that. Yeah. Too. I, I, I've like, I, I've seen, um, you know, different, especially Republican or conservative speakers on campuses where they, they won't, they'll just shout them down or mm-hmm. they won't, they'll like try and keep them from entering the building. And it, it used to be that people went to college to broaden their minds on, in all areas. And, you know, to hear differences of ideas and um, debate things and, and really kind of, you know, we were talking about consistency and inconsistency mm-hmm. of philosophy earlier, um, to really build a consistent philosophy. And it just doesn't seem to be there anymore. Yeah. No, I mean, it's really off the topic of what, what, what you're here to no, talk I mean, about. No, that's, <laughs> that's though, I mean, you do see that uh, with a lot of people. Um, you know, I even brought up, the point about the word ideologue. And so a lot of days, and there's even some intelligent people like uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, Joe Rogan, who will use ideologue in a negative, you know, connotation. Right. And it's just like, okay, look up the origin of the word, right? It was actually created by somebody in the a French person who would be what we would consider a classical liberal. Right. And he was wanting to come up with a word that defined people who supported limited government, mm-hmm. private property rights. Okay, so then, for, like, that's the first thing. So if you support liberty, all right, like, that was the father of the word. Now, right. who are the two people that started popularizing the negative use of the word? Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> Mass murdering tyrant, right? right? Karl Marx, the well, father of communism that resulted in easily over 100 million people right. killed. Those are the first two people that pop. So think about that next time you hear someone use ideologue or calls you an ideologue in a negative way. Right. I would almost be like, you know what? I'm going to embrace ideologue Absolutely. because there is no way I'm going to support people like Napoleon Bonaparte or Karl Marx. Right. And And so, but again, to go to your point about... You know, when you start coming up with a consistent philosophy, you know, that is an ideology and then you're an ideologue, you know. And so but to me, I'm, I'll, I'll take that word back, yeah. you know, so, I, I think it just means principled. Yeah. And exactly. for me, I people often it's like um, 
George W. Bush's famous statement, we have to suspend free market principles or values in order f- to save the free market. Like, yeah. No, George W., we, it doesn't need you. It doesn't need your saving. Um, but, but that's just a way, like that sort of pragmatism as a philosophy and the uh, idea that, you know, we have to shape the economy and mm-hmm. work with all these things that um, are just ways to get people off their principles. And, yes. you know, pragmatism, I, I really want to make the point because I, I've, I've talked about this quite a bit lately and people don't understand what I'm talking about. So pragmatism is a philosophy and it means just doing what works regardless of your principles. Whereas being pragmatic is, you know, saying, well, this is, this makes more sense to do. That's, that's the difference. Um, and that, you know, I, I want, I want to be principled. I'm a principled person. So sometimes I lose because of my principles and that's okay with me because I am not, I don't want to train myself to be a person who will be movable on certain things. I, I believe there's a lot in life that you can compromise on. Compromise is a really important thing. But when it comes to say individual rights, that's somewhere where I just cannot compromise with people. I can work to gain more in an incremental way, but I will never work to take that in an incremental way. So that's, I think that's the difference in, you know, how some people choose to work within the system as opposed to others. Mm -hmm. Um, And it doesn't matter the safety concern, whatever, if it takes the individual's right, that's a road I don't want to go down. So I I think you're very right about the word ideologue. I I am idealistic. Like that's, we don't have a, a anarchist system which doesn't make really much sense either. But, you know, there's not, people are living anarchy every day, but they don't realize it. They yes. don't recognize oh. it. And so yeah. it's hard to convince people to get off of the government nanny state because you're up fighting an uphill battle. But I don't mind being idealistic about it because everything comes from an idea somewhere and, and it's just where you draw your lines. Yeah. And, and to, you know, you mentioned about people not, you know, actions that are happening maybe in what we would call the free market right and then so you know you get a politician that says oh we need to be pragmatic what they're really saying is you need to let me do this problem right you know we can't allow the larger picture to sort (laughs) it out and but you know history has just shown that when people are allowed to cooperate with each other voluntarily yeah far better results than yeah. politicians meddling, but the politicians, their primary thing they care about is power. Yeah. So they want to be perceived that they're doing something. And then when the free market actually does the pop, they weren't able to wreck it completely, then they'll take credit for right. it. Right. Be like, oh, that little change we made. That's yeah. We made the free market do that. And so, yeah. I, I remember just when I first started understanding the economics that you you really can't divorce freedom and economics. They mm-hmm. go together. Um, and just that invisible hand that is talked about and how beautiful it really is. And it really is just people guiding their own lives and me with my own, like what uh, Ayn Rand would have called my selfish, you know, greed, interests, whatever, uh, the virtue of selfishness. Um, with that, working with you so that we both get what we want because I want what I want and you want what you want and we can figure out how to get that together. Mm-hmm. Um, and we don't have an animosity created uh, with each other even if we don't live the same way and we don't like the same things because there's no incentive for us to do that. But when you have a proxy force of the government and I can say, well, I don't have to work with you. I can get the authority to bonk you on the head and make yeah. you do what you want or you get thrown in a rape cage like I it, there, there's, there. It, it creates more divisions than it solves, and you then know. people start fighting over the pie too, which is what exactly. we're seeing happening or escalating in America. Is um, you know, as resources, uh, you know, people are fighting over that pie yeah. uh, more. Uh, you know, I mean, we're what I'm trying to say is we're just seeing the 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 fighting just happen more and more, and yeah. you know, it's, it doesn't really get anywhere but if people had to actually work with each other instead of appeal to authority 
I think a lot of these issues that people are so concerned about go away and not not in a utopian sort of way where we're all going to live together and, Mm -hmm. you know, there's not going to be any harm. I always tell people that freedom and safety aren't synonymous. They don't go together, really. If you have freedom, then you're not terribly safe necessarily. You're as safe as you make yourself. Yeah, but personal if you responsibility. Have, yeah, if you have safety, then you're probably not very free if you have complete and utter safety yeah. in all things. So, uh, and even then, a government can claim to make you safe, but they can never make you safe. Like, Correct. it's just, I, I really, if they, you know, to use their term in a way that they use it as ideologues, they're more ideologues to that than I am. That's more unrealistic because... I know that they can't make me safe, and I know yeah. it's my responsibility to be in charge of my own safety as much as I can be. But they actually believe that the you know the police will keep you safe, and you should give in your guns because yeah yeah they show up after and file a report like that doesn't keep you safe. Well, I mean, the, and the, you know, to make a point back to um, civil asset forfeiture, you know, they'll say, "Oh, we." Need cash because it's drug money right and 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 it's cartel money and they they've used that word cartel money and so to be clear what you're telling me is there's some rural county in tennessee <laughs> you have to take 45 dollars right. and the stop some cartel in mexico that's yeah. what you're telling me and then the institute for justice did a report and they actually said the median forfeiture in tennessee was 502 dollars which goes to what well. you were saying about the low amounts but again it's like if they're not allowed to take $500 from someone, that's it. The drug cartels are right. going to run rampant, you know? Evil wins, Eric. <laughs> yes. Evil wins. Yeah. Uh, well, on that note, okay. uh, we should probably wrap it up, but it's been a great conversation. I knew yeah. it would be. Uh, I always enjoy talking to you, and I learned some things, and I just I keep up the good work, you know? <laughs> yeah. I hope everyone will, you know, take this and and do more research into – the evils of civil asset forfeiture and what can be done to, to kind of stop this, stop the predation of the state. Yeah. And probably the easiest thing you could do is educate people, you know, on the very basics, very in-depth research, because poll after poll is showing that, you know, majority of people are not aware of this issue, but once they're informed just a little bit about this issue, overwhelming majorities are opposed to it. Right criminal conviction uh they don't want to see any property taken unless there's a criminal conviction Mm -hmm. so that's probably the easiest thing anyone can do is just tell friends and family like you know watch literally probably a 30 minute if not even less and then just tell people like this is happening in america because most people don't don't think it is and that's the biggest way someone can help yeah and culture change that's what, what we're all about on the sherry voluntary show so that's it for us today, guys. You can uh, The Sherry Voluntary Show is a product of Little L Productions, and you can catch other great programming, such as The Gold Standard with Alan Mosley, Godarchy with Mike Meharry, Sports Ball with Mike and Alan, and uh, Postcards from Somalia, which, of course, is near and dear to my heart with myself and Alan Mosley. So uh, until next time, peace. <laughs>